Hi, this is John Linnebal from John Linnebal Tutoring, and this is AP U.S. History Video 42, The Early United States in Trade and War. If you like this video, please don't forget to comment, like, share, and subscribe. And if you don't like ads, try my site, testpreparation.locals.com. And here are the effects of new foreign trade and territorial expansion. The U.S. economy demanded new trading partners or increased trade with already existing trading partners. And the U.S. worked hard to establish trade with other countries in the Western Hemisphere, Europe, and Asia as well. Foreign policy of the United States was aimed at increased trade. And that foreign policy, unfortunately, did lead to the War of 1812, and later the U.S. aimed at Asian trade. The U.S. also pushed further into North America at the expense of Canada, Mexico, and perhaps most of all, the Native American nations. As the U.S. gained territory from these other nations, sectional tensions, especially over the expansion of slavery to new territories, intensified. The Barbary Wars, 1801 to 1805. Thomas Jefferson's first presidential foreign policy crisis involved the Middle Eastern trade. The Mediterranean trade was controlled by Morocco, Algiers, Tunis, and Tripoli in a region known as the Barbary Coast. These states extorted payments called tribute from nations wishing to trade in the region. The British Navy protected American ships during the colonial era, era since obviously American ships were from a British colony known as the Americas before the American Revolution, so they're part of the British Empire. Therefore, the British Navy was more than happy to protect its own empire shipping. After the Revolution, of course, the U.S. was no longer part of the empire, so the British Navy did not do anything to protect American shipping at that point. Presidents George Washington and John Adams agreed to terms set by the Barbary States for payments of tribute, so American ships would be left alone and be able to trade with these countries, etc. In 1801, however, Tripoli insisted on much greater payments. Jefferson's response was basically, get lost, we're not paying that, and Tripoli declared war on the United States. So here it says President Thomas Jefferson declared war on the Muslim pirates from Barbary Coast of Tripoli, Tunis, Morocco, and Algiers, but looks like really Tripoli kind of beat them to the punch. Either way, you ended up with a war between the Barbary Coast powers and the United States. So, Barbary Wars, it involves millions for defense, not one cent for tribute, like this clip from Curb Your Enthusiasm, Season 10, Episode 2. Millions for defense, not one cent for tribute. Jefferson sent ships to protect shipping and fight the Barbary Coast powers. You might have heard the Marines hymn before, you know, from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. Okay. So that's where that comes from. The halls of Montezuma obviously refers to conflicts with Mexico. The shores of Tripoli refers to this Barbary Coast problem. So while sending in the Navy and the Marines was not a decisive victory for the U.S., but the action worked well enough to give the U.S. a reputation in the world community, so it ended up being a net positive for the United States. It let people know, hey, don't mess with the U.S. Yes, we do have a Navy that can actually protect our shipping, which is something you really need if you're going to be taken seriously at all as a country on the world stage. So we'll move on to the next thing. Conflicts with European powers. There were problems, of course, with Britain and France under Washington and John Adams, and those problems continued under Jefferson and James Madison. Jefferson and Madison wished to continue Washington's policy of neutrality, combined with attempts to expand foreign trade, occasionally with nations fighting wars against each other. So the idea is the U.S. really, like any country, is basically going to trade with anybody. Certainly merchants from any country are going to basically trade with anybody. But when you do that, you're occasionally going to end up trading with people on both sides of a war. Just like if you have enough friends, eventually you're going to have two friends who hate each other. So what does that mean for the United States in you know the early 1800s? Well, ended up with after Napoleon, who was leading France at the time, declared war on Britain in 1803, the U.S. initially profited from trade with both warring nations. However, Britain and France both took action to stop the U.S. from trading with the other. See, for example, video 35 in this series, which details the U.S. shipping's conflicts with the British Navy and the France's allowing privateers, that is, pirates, to seize U.S. ships. 
So, impressment. The Chesapeake Leopard Affair. Britain was much more aggressive than France, stopping and boarding U.S. ships and occasionally impressing or press-ganging U.S. sailors into service on British Navy ships. Let's take a look at another clip from Curb Your Enthusiasm. You, you know, they tried to impress our seamen, right? They'd be on the ship, they'd yell across at one of our ships, Hey there! We have the best dental plan in all of Europe. Why? Look at our bicorn hats and fancy brass buttons. How's that, sailors? Are you impressed by that? So, it really wasn't an, an intent, an intent, I should say, an attempt. It was not really an attempt to, in quotes, impress people in the sense that, wow, we're really impressed. It was an attempt to force American seamen to serve in the British Navy or perhaps on British merchant ships, but most likely the British Navy. So the excuse used by the British Navy was, hey, these U.S. sailors are actually British deserters. Most of them weren't. According to Barron's AP United States History 4th edition, roughly 6,000 U.S. sailors were impressed between 1803 and 1812. So you can see more below and you can go to the impressment article on Wikipedia to read from the sources that I have used. Anyway, the Jay Treaty, effective 1795, addressed many issues that the American Revolution had not settled, but it did prevent new hostilities between the U.S. and Great Britain. One issue the Jay Treaty didn't address was British impressment of sailors from American ships and ports, which again became a major problem, and you can see Jay's Treaty in video 33. Non-British subjects were not subject to impressment, but Britain considered anyone born a British subject as still British, not a naturalized U.S. citizen if they had settled the United States. So the Royal Navy impressed over 9,000 sailors who claimed to be American citizens. Note that this is about 50% more than the figure cited by Barron's. Perhaps the additional 3,000 sailors were actually British sailors who merely claimed U.S. citizenship falsely. Either way, that's a lot of seized sailors. Impressment, the Chesapeake Leopard Affair continued. During the war with France, 1793 to 1815, the British Royal Navy forcefully reclaimed British deserters on board merchant ships of other nations and in American port cities. President Jefferson allowed illegal impressments to avoid annoying Britain as he was trying to negotiate a treaty to obtain, in quotes, the Floridas. I know that sounds like something an old man would say, but hey, remember, this is the early 1800s. Anyway. So as Jefferson was trying to get the Floridas handed over to the United States, he would allow these British, whatever, British Navy, maybe the equivalent of their shore patrol to go and seize sailors and have them serve in the British Navy. But the British pushed it too far. In 1805, the British began seizing American merchantmen, you know, that is the ships, trading with the West Indies, also seizing their ships and their cargoes as a penalty for illegal trading. So, under the British rule of 1756, wartime direct trade between a neutral European state and a British colony was forbidden if such trade had not existed in time of peace. So, U.S. ports and shipping firms first undermined this policy by, in quotes, landing European shipments in the U.S. where shippers were issued false certificates of payment of duties, that is, taxes, on imported goods that hadn't really been paid. And the cargo wasn't even taken off the ships. So... It was only landed in the sense that, you know, yes, it did actually dock in the port long enough to get their false certificates, but nothing was taken off the ship. So the ships would then sail to the West Indies with its nice, safe American cargo. So, hey, this is all cargo we got in the U.S. And, hey, the U.S. is a you know, firm that already is a... <laughs> I should say, the U.S. is a country that already had an existing trading relationship with the West Indies, so no big deal. So possibly you could have a front ship come to the United States, get a nice clean American certificate of duties paid, and you know basically say, oh yeah, this is all American goods that were lo we loaded up here, and da 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 da, and then take it to the British West Indies, allowing for a trade between France and Great, you know, part of the British Empire, the British West Indies, for example. Okay, so think of money laundering except with cargo. Here's a clip from Better Call Saul. Now, this is the nail salon, right? I take your dirty money, 
and I slip it into the salon's nice, clean cash flow. The revenues from the salon go to the owner. That's you. Your filthy drug money has been transformed into nice, clean, taxable income. The British learned of cargo laundering, and that's my term, during a court case involving the seizure of the Essex. The court ruled that the Essex's cargo was never meant to be sold in America, so the stop at a U.S. port could be disregarded, and the trip could thus be considered a continuous journey from Europe to the West Indies. So they just say, ah, that's stopping the U.S. That's kind of a shell transaction. It's, you know, it's a straw man. It didn't really happen. So the British finally blockaded New York Harbor with two Royal Navy frigates, the Cambrian and Leander, sparking public demonstrations. The next year, many American ships con were condemned in British Admiralty courts. So that meant the courts ruled, yes, you can take these ships. It's perfectly acceptable under British law that you seize them. And American seamen were impressed more often. So, the flashpoint of this conflict was the Chesapeake Leonard Affair. The 50 gun British HMS Leopard fired upon the 38 gun US frigate Chesapeake, which was not prepared for battle. The results were that three US citizens were killed and four were abducted by the Royal Navy. The full story is as follows again, under the Wikipedia Impressment article. So, let's move on. In the early summer of 1807, three alleged deserters from the British frigate HMS Melampus, lying in Chesapeake Bay, enlisted on the American frigate USS Chesapeake. After the British searched the Chesapeake, the purported deserters, David Martin, John Strachan, and William Ware, were found to be wrongly impressed native-born Americans. However, another crew member listed in the ship's records as Jenkin Ratford was actually found to be a, Brad a not a British, a British deserter, but he could not be physically located. Annoyed, Admiral Berkeley ordered all British North Atlantic squadron commanders to search the Chesapeake if they encountered it on the high seas. A boat from the British frigate HMS Leopard in intercepted the Chesapeake but Commodore Barron refused to allow his crew to be mustered. So Leopard soon approached and its commander shouted a warning. Barron replied, I don't hear what you say. So Leopard then fired two shots across the bow and then almost immediately shot a broadside into the American ship. So, okay, here's your warning shot. Oh, you know, two seconds later, whatever, just a very short while later. Oh, okay, now we're gonna fire on your ship. You know, too bad, you should have obeyed our warning. Anyway. So, three crew were killed and 18 wounded. The British boarding party arrested the British deserter, so they found uh, Jenkin Ratford, I guess, and the three Americans. So, the Chesapeake Leopard Affair provoked an outcry for war from the whole nation. Jefferson later wrote, The affair of the Chesapeake put the war into my hand. I had only to open it and let havoc loose. He ordered the state governors to ready their militias, but the Embargo Act of 1807 that he eventually passed only ordered all British armed vessels out of American waters and forbade all contact with them if they remained. Impressment and ship seizures caused serious diplomatic tension, and they helped to turn American public opinion against Britain. The public saw impressment as humiliating and dishonoring the U.S. because the U.S. was unable to protect its ships and sailors. It makes sense. If you're forcing someone to do something he or she doesn't want to do, it's interpersonally, it's bullying. And on the national level, you know, it's, well, it's extortion on the personal level as, way, as well. You know, I'm going to do this to you unless you do something you don't want to do. Bullying, you know, it's the big bully holds down the little kid and, you know, takes his hand and slaps him with it. Why are you slapping yourself? Why are you slapping yourself? You know, so basically this is writ large on the national level. So it's also possibly other crimes or torts, you know, violations of rights that would happen between people. So this is, again, kind of writ large between nations. That really annoys people when their nation is being messed with by another nation. So this led to the War of 1812. Free trade and peaceful coercion, or the Oh Grab Me Act. Jefferson signed the Embargo Act 1807, which forbade trade with foreign countries in an attempt to stop British impressment of US sailors and the seizure of ships and cargo. 
So the embargo of 1807, the difficult years from embargo to the War of 1812 on Weebly.com. You can look this up if you'd like to see another of my source materials here. Mostly the Embargo Act did nothing other than nearly destroy the U.S.'s mercantile, that is, trading class, especially in New England. The textile mills can't stay open if the cloth can't be shipped abroad, because then they're not making money, are they? The Embargo Act was replaced with the Non-Intercourse Act of 1809. Get your mind out of the gutter, it's not that kind of intercourse. Anyway, the Non-Intercourse Act opened U.S. ports to all nations except Britain and France. That was still unpopular because Britain and France were the U.S.'s largest trade partners. And we can see this editorial cartoon, you know, so notice they didn't want to say the word damn, so damn it, how it, how he nicks him. Oh, this cursed, oh, grab me. And so you notice, oh, grab me is embargo spelled backwards. Ha, ha, ha. Okay, so let's move on. Macon's Bill Number 2, 1810. Attempting to stimulate trade, Congress passed Macon's Bill Number 2 in 1810. The bill stated that if either Britain or France agreed not to interfere with U.S. trade, the U.S. would prohibit trade with the other. So that would obviously, or at least it would hopefully, give them an, an incentive to both be the first, so that way they could trade with the United States, and the United States wouldn't trade with their enemy. Napoleon accepted this offer first, so, well, he just accepted it, and the British didn't anyway. So the U.S. banned trade with Britain in 1811. France reneged on the agreement and kept interfering by seizing U.S. ships, and the trade conflict with Britain brought the U.S. and Britain close to war. That wasn't great for the U.S. because both Britain and France were still interfering with it, and the U.S. ended up really annoying Britain. Guess what happened next? The War of 1812. The trade conflicts and pressure from Warhawk congressmen led Congress to declare war on Great Britain. The congressional votes were divided almost completely by region, so you had New England, the mills, remember, and some Middle Atlantic states opposed it, but the South and the Midwest supported the war. The war declaration happened just when Britain was promising it would stop interfering with U.S. shipping. The war lasted two years. The British won early victories such as the Battle of Fort Dearborn and the Battle of Detroit. President Madison managed to gain re-election in 1813, but the Federalists didn't lose by much. They were gaining traction because the war, well, wars as they tend to do become unpopular as they drag on and people experience the actual effects of the war. The War of 1812 continued. U.S. forces did manage to win some battles in 1813, burning the city of York, which is now Toronto, and winning some other battles on the Northern Lakes, as well as winning some naval battles, including, well, they also went to Niagara on the Lake and burned down Niagara on the Lake, and the Canadians did respond to that by crossing the border and burning Buffalo to the ground. But anyway, the Battle of the Thames, Canada, you, you know, fought in Canada, not the Thames in London, England, and at that battle, the U.S. forces defeated the British and the Native Americans led by Tecumseh, a rather famous Native American leader. However, the British also managed to strike back hard. In 1814, the British burned several important government buildings in Washington, D.C. That's why the White House is white, because that was the presidential mansion. It got some nasty stains on it from, well, being burned out. And so they painted it nice and white. The War of 1812, even more. In 1815, General, later President Andrew Jackson, led the U.S. troops to victory over the British at the Battle of New Orleans. It's a shame that the war was already over, so neither the British nor the U.S. troops knew of the British and U.S. had signed a peace treaty in late 1814. But the treaty didn't take effect until the Senate advised and consented required by the Constitution on February 16th, 1815. That is, the Senate has to sign off on these treaties. And yes, I see it says neither or. Shame on me, that should be neither nor. Oh well, anyway, that was the Treaty of Ghent that settled or ended the War of 1812. 
There are some songs you've probably heard. You probably heard The Battle of New Orleans by Johnny Horton. And you may have even heard the parody, The Battle of Cucamonga. Hartford Convention, opposition to the War of 1812. The first major challenge to federal policy in the 1800s was not from the South over slavery, but from New England over the War of 1812. The War of 1812 was unpopular with some, especially New England manufacturers and traders. Massachusetts actually secretly had initial negotiations with Britain for a separate peace treaty. Thus, this cartoon in the background, Leap or No Leap. So you can see, oh, okay, you can't see the whole thing, but Little Road will jump the first. Oh, great, they're going to force Rhode Island to jump. Oh, but we must jump. And so we see somebody with a crown, dressed in a nice red British uniform. Oh, tis my Yankee boys, jump in, my fine fellows. Plenty of molasses and codfish, plenty of goods to smuggle, honors, titles, and nobility in the bargain. So I strongly and most fervently pray for, the, for this great leap, my vulgar name, into the Lord of Essex, da 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 da, da. Okay, so basically the editorial cartoonist is saying, oh, look, the British are promising you all sorts of things if you turn against the United States and basically reach a peace agreement or a separate peace with the British. The New England war opposers had a convention in Hartford, Connecticut in 1814. The most radical New England war opposition did actually want to secede from the Union, but that proposal was rejected. However, they did agree to petition to have the law changed, so a two-thirds congressional vote was needed to declare war in the future. And eventually that was changed. The Treaty of Ghent. The War of 1812 was ended by a treaty negotiated in Ghent, Netherlands. The U.S. knew it couldn't win the war, so it was actually eager to end the war. The U.S. and Britain agreed to return everything to its pre-war state. The boundary is the captured territory, only between the U.S. and Britain would be returned, and the pre-war U.S.-Canada border would be accepted as the border. So it's as though the war never happened, except for all the killing and bloodshed and everything. Ha ha ha, that's meant as an ironic joke. Anyway. Huge problem. The treaty said nothing about the British actions that led the U.S. to declare war in the first place, including interference with U.S. shipping, impressment of U.S. seamen, or aid to Native Americans who opposed the U.S. So this has echoes of Jay's treaty, which ended the revolution and had many similar defects. No reparations for British destruction of Americans' property, etc. If you want to know more about that, you can see video 33 about Jay's treaty. Old China Trade. After the revolution, the U.S. merchants opened very profitable trade with China since it was no longer prevented by Britain. Mercantilism, remember, you know, Britain really didn't want the U.S. doing anything other than just trading with Great Britain and supplying a lot of raw materials so British industry could use it and make the finished goods and then sell them on the world, on the world stage, world market, if you like. The U.S. enjoyed trading for Chinese porcelain, like China, get it, ha ha ha, silk, tea, again, you know, tea from China, and nankeen, which is coarse cotton cloth, and the U.S. believed it had a right to trade and saw trade as generally productive for all involved. So that's basically today's attitude towards trade in most countries, certainly the United States. The Chinese, however, saw merchants as low class and superfluous, so kind of unnecessary and useless, because merchants made a profit without making a product. So the emperors of China saw trade as a privilege for foreigners who acknowledged China was superior to their own nations. So you had to basically beg and kiss their feet, etc., and say, oh, you're so great. Will you please trade with us? Okay. Old China trade. The U.S. gained favorable trading status when merchants found China had a great demand for furs, which could be obtained from the Native American tribes on the West Coast through the maritime fur trade. This eventually led to the end of the old China trade in 1844. At that point, the U.S. and China negotiated the Treaty of Wanghia. I'm sure I butchered that pronunciation, I'm sorry. And yes, I see that negotiate rather than negotiated. Oh, well, oops. Anyway. The U.S. was granted the same trading rights as given to Britain, a nation with growing trading power in China. So that actually worked pretty well for the U.S. Nationalism and the Monroe Doctrine. The U.S.'s new confidence was expressed in the Monroe Doctrine, stated in President Monroe's foreign policy address to Congress in 1823. Monroe was alarmed by the aim of the so-called Holy Alliance of Russia, Prussia, and Austria. Yeah, that sounds pretty holy to me. All right, anyway. 
to restore the Spanish colonies and presumably run them rather than having Spain run them. Monroe opposed Russia's claim to all North American territory above the first 51st parallel, the 51st parallel, not the first parallel. And while these problems were resolved, Monroe warned world powers to stay out of the Americas. While the U.S. was a pretty new nation and certainly didn't have anywhere near the military might to enforce the Monroe Doctrine, it was an important statement of intent that, along with Washington's farewell address, set the tone for U.S. isolationist. I'll try to say it again. U.S.'s isolationist foreign policy and later U.S. actions in Latin America that were questionable. We'll talk about those in later videos. Anyway, you can also see video 33 to learn a little bit more about the Monroe Doctrine. Did you find this video useful? Please like it and subscribe to my channel. Neither action costs you anything, and you'll be alerted about my new videos. Why? It's simple. The U.S. not the U.S. YouTube doesn't let me share any ad revenue unless I have a thousand subscribers and four thousand hours. That's two hundred and forty thousand minutes of view time in a year. While many people are watching these, I don't have four thousand hours of watch time in the last year. I don't have a thousand subscribers at this time, although I'm getting very close, so wouldn't it make you feel good to be the one who puts me over the top? Anyway, this ad money will help me make more videos, so we both win, because you get more product and you didn't even have to pay for it. So if you saw an ad during this video, and there's a good chance you did, please know I didn't get any of the ad money and I won't until I have the subscribers and view time that YouTube demands. I called it, they basically changed their policy and started running ads during non-monetized videos, etc. So I know at least some of you have seen ads during my videos or before or after, and I got nothing from that. So just so you know. For the same reasons, you are not only welcome, but encouraged to share links to this video, put it in playlists, etc. I gladly read and respond to constructive criticism or suggestions for new videos. I reserve the right to delete comments such as troll posts or spam. And you can hire me for tutoring. If you are in the San Francisco Bay Area, I will gladly come to your place or we can meet somewhere. You can definitely hire me. I'm also open to tutoring through Zoom, and I've done it so you could be anywhere in the world as long as you have an internet connection and have Zoom or some other video software we can use. On that note, thanks for watching. If you want some contact information and a little bit more, keep watching. Otherwise, thanks for watching. Contact me. All right, Facebook, www.facebook.com forward slash Linaball Tutoring. Instagram, it's Instagram.com, John.Linaball.Tutoring. My phone number is 415-623-4251. That's my cell phone. You can text me. You can call me. Hey, go for it. Email John at JohnLinaball.com. Website, JohnLinaball.com or JohnLinaballTutoring.com. They both take you to the same place. TestPreparation.Locals.com. And I'm even on LBRY TV, you know, kind of a cool way to abbreviate library, I guess. Anyway, at John Linaball Tutoring and my... Mailing address is John Linneball Tutoring at 1859 Powell Street, number 109, San Francisco, California, 94133. And finally, please note this is not a substitute for your classes, text, etc. This video is based on Barron's AP United States History Review Book, 4th edition, and any other sources listed in the video description. For this one, mostly just Wikipedia articles, and my general knowledge of U.S. history and whatever else I talk about during these videos. While this should help you do well on the AP U.S. History exam, I cannot be responsible for what your teacher thinks is important and asks you about on his or her own tests, homework, etc. Please, please, please read your class texts and pay attention to what your teacher says in class. And you will do well in your AP classes, not just on the AP exam. All right, with that, I bid you a good day, night, evening, whatever time it is, and good luck on the AP exam. Thanks.